Drop the gun. Drop the gun. Drop it. Hey, just drop your gun. We can work this out. Drop it. Drop it. Drop your gun. Sir. Drop your gun. Hey, we can work this out. It's not that big of a deal. Drop your gun. Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm Law Enforcement Chaplain Samuel Jepson. I'm a retired cop of 25 years and I've served as a law enforcement chaplain for eight years. I serve one of the largest and finest law enforcement agencies here in the state of Arizona. I also serve the Arizona State Chaplain Service and the Phoenix Chapter of the Blue Knights. Today we're going to be talking about PTSD and how it affects you and how you can get rid of it. We're going to have all the tools that you need to discover what to do to solve this problem in your life. In today's world, information is very discoverable and we've compiled some of the very best for you. This video is going to be broken down into four sections. Number one, the symptoms of someone who is suffering from PTSD. Number two, some truths about PTSD. Number three, the steps you can use to help someone recover from PTSD. And number four, some recovery stories of PTSD survivors. I want to share a personal letter that was written by a friend of mine. His name is Garrett Bake, and with his permission, I'm, I'm able to use this letter. I want you to listen to the words that he says, and I want you to see if you find yourself in his letter. He titled it, What's Wrong With You? You Are Broken. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, how many times I felt this way, how many times I stopped doing anything because I felt trapped. I was told I was broken, and I needed to be fixed by my coworkers, by my family, by my spiritual leaders. And I accepted that story. It became who I was. I walked into my own prison cell, locked the door, and threw away the key. I gave up thinking there was a solution, that there was a way out, that I had the answers. I turned to different forms of sedation just to try and numb the pain that I felt. But it didn't help because it didn't actually solve anything. I would go to shrinks, spiritual leaders, motivational speakers, and they all said the same thing, I was broken. Is this how you feel? Is this what you've been told? And more importantly, is this what you believe about yourself? Then he goes on. Then I was introduced to a possibility, the possibility that I wasn't broken, that I didn't have to be locked away in my own prison, that all I had to do was accept the truth about my reality and commit to do something about it. Those are his words, not mine. But committing to do something about it is the first step, and that's the step that you need to take. Traumatic stress overload, or post-traumatic stress disorder, can come by two different ways, by a singular horrific experience, or by an accumulation of lesser experiences that have built up over time. And now that once simmering pot of water has become a boiling pot of water. When the simmering water becomes boiling water, the irrational mind often takes over the rational mind. And this is where our most regrettable mistakes are made. For instance, in my 25 year police career, I went to no less than three dozen suicide calls. No less. Some were successful, some were unsuccessful, and some were just crying out for help. But the point is, to the person considering suicide, suicide is the most rational decision in the world not realizing that they are choosing a permanent solution to a temporary problem. A problem that can be solved if you will just reach out and ask for help. But that's what happens when the pot of simmering water becomes a pot of boiling water and the irrational mind takes over the rational mind. Over the years, I've received a lot of training on PTSD and how to handle it and how to help those who are suffering with it. Recently, I attended a six-day, 24-hour PTSD retreat, or camp. 
At the end of that, I went to the chaplain to try and help these people, but at the end of that, I had two peer team members and two clinicians walk up to me and say, Sam, do you have any idea that you are suffering with major PTSD issues? I was shocked at what they said. I, I even laughed it off. But they came up to me and they said this, Sam, many of the things you said and the way you said them, whether you realize it or not, you have a lot of pent up PTSD issues. One clinician said, you scared them, Sam. But it was the words of the head clinician that walked up to me and said, Sam, I'd like to work with you. I think you are salvageable. It was those words that shook me to the core and made me re-examine my life and take, a look and take stock of how I've been acting and what I've been doing. Warning, the next five minutes contains police experiences police pictures, and low-tone audio police dash cams. If you are hypersensitive to these sights and sounds, fast forward five minutes. Did I honestly have PTSD? Me? A retired cop of 18 years and a chaplain of eight years? Yes, I had been in nine triple nines. And yes, I had been in four officer and ball shootings. And yes, I had been in a shootout that ended with one bullet hole in my police car, four in Ben's, and 56 in the suspect's vehicle. And yes, I had chased a suspect into a home where he fired a shotgun at me, missing my abdomen by inches as he fired through the door I stood behind. And yes, I had missed a guy in another shooting and had asked to go to the police range for more practice instead of going to see the department psychologist for counseling. And yes, I have fought for my life. And once I was so scared, I made the decision that I was gonna smash out a plate glass window, run through it, and I was gonna shoot anybody that ran after me. And in another such fight, my partner now wears a one inch by three inch plate in his head to cover the hole that was bashed into his skull. And yes, in another such fight, I almost shot and killed a 14 year old girl and would have had she grabbed my partner's gun instead of grabbing mine. What saved her life is that she grabbed my gun instead. And yes, I still see the faces of the people that I watched die. And yes, I've delivered over 30 next of kin notifications. And yes, I've worked four line of duty deaths. And yes, I've been to about 15 or more police funerals. And yes, I was with paramedics at a wreck when we made the decision to save one person's life and let the other one die because we just couldn't save both. And yes, I watched that poor woman slowly die because there was nothing we could do for her. And yes, she is just one of the faces that I still see. And yes, I was first on the scene of a rollover accident with fatalities where a woman who was nine months pregnant and going into labor was trapped in her car. And yes, I did lay in the dirt next to her for over 15 minutes before anyone else arrived on scene. Reaching inside her car, helping her try the best I could, keeping her head turned away from her dead and crushed and badly deformed husband, who was seated next to her. And yes, she did go into labor, and yes, her baby died too. And yes, I witnessed a car crash that burst into flames and I still smell the smell of the burning flesh of the young man who was trapped inside and couldn't get out and no one could get to him to save him. And yes, I stood there and watched helplessly as he burned inside. And yes, when the fire was out and his body was recovered and the wreckage was taken away, I missed his leg and left it behind at the scene and his mother found it the next morning. And yes, there is that one incident that haunts me the most, that still makes me cringe every time it enters my mind. A single vehicle rollover with four occupants that happened while I was off duty 33 years ago, before cell phones and miles from town. I was one of the very first on scene, and I immediately flipped into police mode and began surveying the scene and figuring the needs. The two occupants in the front seat had been ejected during the rollover. They were dead. No need for first aid. Trapped in the rear seat was an old man and an old woman, hanging upside down, still seat belted in the car. The woman was closest to me when I got down in the dirt and looked at her. She was closest to me, and her head was 
obviously broken, very badly deformed, and her husband was hanging next to her, upside down, holding her hand and singing a song about Jesus. I, in the dirt, I sat there and I looked at him and I listened to the words of his song. And then I looked at her and then I got up and I walked away and then I drove away. The sleeping pill that I gave my subconscious was is that I was a professional and that I needed to get professional help for him. But that wasn't the truth. I could have sent someone there on scene to do that. I didn't have to do that. I could have laid in the dirt alongside him, just like I had done five years earlier to that poor woman who was pregnant. And I could have stuck my hand in the car and I could have comforted him. But what had happened, brothers and sisters, is in just seven years of law enforcement, I had become so cold to human suffering that I could look at three dead people, see one lone survivor holding the hand of his wife, and I could feel nothing, no compassion for him. Only an accident scene with things that needed to be done. That still haunts me, but I've made peace with those memories. I've learned how. And yes, I have seen lots of dead and mangled bodies. And yes, two of my old sergeants committed suicide, one while I was on his squad, and another old sergeant was arrested and will spend the rest of his life in prison. And yes, there have been lots of calls that involve death and tragedy and suffering over my 25-year career that have changed me personally and inside and affected in me emotionally and that I still see in my mind. And yes, they have affected the way I live my life now. And yes, toward the end of my career, just donning my uniform and showing up for work was making me physically and emotionally sick. My stomach was beginning to churn all the time. And yes, when I was asked to serve as a law enforcement chaplain in 2010, the first time I climbed back into a police car, then 10 years after I retired, it was all I could do to suppress the almost overpowering urge to vomit. And yes, it was that way for the first year. Every time I climbed into another police cruiser, I had to fight that churning, sickening feeling in my stomach. And yes, 18 years later, as I sat in a group of first responders as a chaplain trying to help them as a chaplain, I caved in. I caved in like I've never caved in before and I cried like a little boy as I tried to tell my story and as I remembered my experiences. But all that's just police work, right? Right, it is just police work as a matter of fact. It's just police work. And whether my stories, whether I've gone through more things than you have, or you've gone through more things than I have, it doesn't make any difference. We've all experienced police work and that's what police work does to all of us. And if you are suffering with pent up issues of PTSD, whether you know it or not, if you know it, you need to get help. If your family knows it, but you don't know it, you need to get help. You need to get it out. So because of my personal experiences, I have a lot of empathy for other people who have had horrible experiences in their life. But I don't have a lot of sympathy. Because sympathy, even though it feels good on the inside, sympathy will make you weaker and it will grow the problem and make the problems uh, larger. Stay away from sympathy. But I have a lot of empathy. Because empathy helps people become stronger. It helps them get over the problems they have. And it shrinks the problem instead of grows the problem. So never get involved in, in, in lapping up sympathy. Always seek empathy and seek the way out. A wise man once said, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Here are the signs and symptoms of PTSD. Now you tell me how you score. Unexplained pain, headaches, dizziness, fatigue, back or chest pain. Getting upset at things that remind you of what happened. Mood swings, nightmares, vivid memories or flashbacks. Feeling emotionally cut off from others. Feeling numb inside or losing interest in things. Behavioral changes, hypervigilance, being constantly on guard. Irritability, depression, anxiety or experiencing outbursts of anger. Repression, 
purposefully and continually blocking out certain memories. Feeling guilt or shame, maybe because you survived and someone else didn't. Having difficulty sleeping or staying asleep. Having trouble concentrating, being jumpy or easily startled. Avoiding places or things that remind you of what happened. Increased drinking or use of drugs or meds to numb the feelings of pain. Considering harming yourself. Keeping yourself super busy, working just to occupy your mind. Isolating, pulling away from your family, friends in crowded places. And with these symptoms lasting longer than two months. Now let's look at some truths about PTSD that just might surprise you. Number one, PTSD is very real. It's not an imaginary problem. Number two, not everyone who claims to have PTSD has it. Number three, and some who claim to have PTSD just have burnout instead. Number four, there are those who have PTSD that don't realize they have it. Number five, what you experienced, the event you went through, is only a contributing factor to your PTSD. It is not the reason you have PTSD. The fact is, no two people will process the same experience the same way. For instance, you might have 20 first responders that show up on a scene, a horrific scene, and all work the scene. But after it's all over, only one, maybe two, will have PTSD. Number six, we, everyone you see, has experienced PTS, or post-traumatic stress, stemming from a PTSE, a post-traumatic stress experience. Whether you get PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from a PTSE, depends on how you internalize the event. In other words, it's not the severity of the event that you went through, it's how you internalized it. That's what makes the difference. Number seven, PTSD is all in your head. It's not in your arms, it's not in your legs, it's not in your hands, it's not in your feet or your stomach. It's all in your head. Number eight, it must come out. Number nine, you may need professional help to get it out. Number 10, the alternative to getting it out is train wrecking. Either in your career, your marriage, or your life, either sooner or later, either a little or a lot. Think of PTSD as having walking pneumonia. Walking pneumonia will not kill you, but if left untreated, walking pneumonia can turn into pneumonia, and that can kill you. Number 11, there is no surgery, no magic pill, no silver bullet, and there is no bowl of cake and ice cream way through getting out of PTSD. Getting it out is painful, and it takes a belief that you can get it out and that you can overcome it. In the words of Gene Hackman in the movie Uncommon Valor, you're never going to get rid of the memories. You're only going to learn to make peace with them. So if you've been trying to get rid of the memories, if you think that recovering from PTSD is somehow getting rid of the memories, well, give that idea up because that's just not going to happen. What you will do is you will learn to be able to live with the memories and they'll be just fine. They'll no longer bother you. Number 13. PTSD is not a disease or an unkillable monster. PTSD is an anxiety disorder, period. Number 14. PTSD is the reoccurring memories of a horrific event that is no longer taking place in your life. That's all. It is not the event reoccurring. Number 15. To overcome PTSD, you must understand what PTSD is and never fall into the trap of making more of it than it is. Number 16. You must believe that you can be helped. The mind is an interesting supercomputer. The part of the brain that controls your fight or flight system is called the amygdala. It's just about right dead center in the brain. What happens when someone gets PTSD is their fight or flight button gets stuck in the on position. 
PTSD is also controlled by the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that does the remembering of the fear. There aren't many treatments for PTSD. Doctors rely on talk therapy and medication. There are two other parts of the brain that you need to understand how they work and how they work for and against you. That is the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is like the computer on your desk. All it does is gather and hold information, giving it back to you when you ask for it. The conscious mind is the typer, is the keyboard. It types the information into the subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind doesn't care anything about you. It is literally like the computer on your desk. It has no feeling for you at all. It just stores information. The conscious mind is, is what decides what goes into the subconscious mind. That's the keyboard. When you believe or don't believe that you can be helped, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for you. What you think and believe can harm you, and your subconscious mind will bring you all the information to prove your theory of the way things are. So believing that you can be helped is, is paramount. You cannot be helped unless you do. In fact, even if you go to a clinician and talk to a clinician, they will tell you that if you don't believe that you can be helped, there's very little that they can do for you. Number 17. With training, anyone with a good moral compass can help you, but choosing the right kind of person to help you is paramount. There's a story of a man who's walking along and falls in a hole, and he fears that he's never going to be able to get out of this hole ever again. A friend comes by, looks down, and sees him in the hole. Feels very sorry for him. Says, if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know, and then walks on. A good friend comes by, sees his friend in the hole, feels really bad for him, climbs down in the hole with him, sits alongside him, puts his arm around him, and commiserates with him. Then comes a really good friend, who comes along and sees his friend in the hole, doesn't feel sympathy for him, isn't willing to get in the hole with him, but instead kneels down at the edge of the hole and reaches down in with his hand to grab his hand his friend's hand and pull him out of the hole. When you are looking for people to help you, you make sure that the people that you seek are like your very best friends that will tell you what you need to hear instead of what you want to hear. Never make more of PTSD than it is and never believe that PTSD is a hole that you cannot get out of. And in your search for help, like I said, look for the really good friends the ones that will not feel sorry for you, or get in the hole, or commiserate with you, but instead will offer you a hand up. Number 18. PTSD is usually thought of as being brought on by a singular horrific event, but it can also be brought on by an accumulation of events. And in all probability, that's the PTSD that you are suffering from. For example, Far less people who join the military actually go to war. And of those that go to war, far less see combat. And of those that see combat, far less actually kill someone or are seriously injured themselves. The same is true with police work. Of those who become cops, far less actually ever shoot someone or get shot in the line of duty. In fact, the overwhelming odds are a police officer will go his entire career and never shoot anyone or get shot, or get seriously injured. So PTSD in these cases is from an accumulation of events. If this is your case, military or first responder, your PTSD is just as real, but realize that you have a far easier uphill battle to recovery than someone who has gone through a singular horrific event involving loss of life or serious bodily injury. If this is your case, you might need professional help. An exceptionally good source for help is your department's employee assistance program. They are a very confidential source of help and information. And if you need, if you're afraid to walk in there and ask for help, then ask your chaplain to walk in there and make the appointment for him and then give the time to you. But I can promise you, if you go through your EAP program, the information that you give them is not going to come back to your department. For those who have extreme PTSD, I strongly recommend the West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat, or WCPR, 
also known as the First Responder Support Network. I'm not affiliated with them, but I know them and I know their incredible ability to help other people who are suffering with extreme cases of PTSD, and I highly recommend them. For you in the military, I strongly recommend you contact the VA and the Wounded Warrior Project. They have some excellent programs, and a lot of the training that you are receiving here, the information that you're receiving here, is coming from them. Let's look at the legal definition of just what PTSD is. Post-traumatic stress disorder refers to a mental disorder that results from an extreme traumatic stress. A post-traumatic stress disorder becomes a mental disorder only if it meets these six criteria. Number one, exposure to an extremely stressful traumatic event that involves personal experience with actual or threatened death or serious injury. Number two, a response of fear, helplessness, or horror. Number three, repeated or re-experiencing of the event. Number four, persistent symptoms or increased arousal. And number five, with the symptoms lasting longer than 30 days. And number six, clinically significant impairment in important areas of functioning. Now let's look at the tools used to loosen the over-tightened screws that we all get from police work or from the military or sometimes just from life. You have to understand that the tools for PTSD is not rocket science. It is not something that just takes just the most incredible, brilliant person to be able to use. It's like driving a car. You don't have to know all the engineering facts to make that car work. All you have to do is to know which pedal makes it go fast, which pedal makes it go slow, which way to turn the steering wheel, and which way to use the reverse and forward, and then how to operate it on the road without running into people or things. And the tools for PTSD recovery are that simple. That said, remember this phrase, do no harm, which means when you are working with someone, if you can tell that you are over your head with a problem, then stop and get help. Regardless of your level of expertise, stop and get help. Here are the six steps or phases that you will go through in your recovery from PTSD. And don't be discouraged if you see that each phase takes some time to get through. And don't be discouraged if you see you need to stop and seek professional help. The key is to stay on the path, keep pressing forward, and don't stop. And in your struggles to try and overcome PTSD or any problem, don't be afraid to reach out to God. I know we live in a world where it seems to be unpopular to believe in God and, or even talk about God, but the fact is he lives, he's not out golfing, he's very concerned with your life, and he knows more about you than anyone will ever know about you, and he's willing to help. All you have to do is reach out. And you and some people say, well, if there is such a thing as God, why isn't he down here solving all the problems? Why isn't he stopping the chaos and everything else, all the evil that's happening? Well, that's a great expectation if God's greatest desire for himself is to be an eternal nursery leader, always having to solve all of our problems, always having to stop us from finding fault, and always having to stop us from fighting every chance we get. But if he wants more for himself than that, and if he wants more for you and me than that, then he's got to be able to do things his way and not our way. His wisdom is far greater than our wisdom, and he has a reason for doing things the way he's doing them. Our life here is our opportunity to leave home there, live here on the most complex college campus ever constructed, learn from our own experiences and choices, armed only with our own moral compasses and spiritual impressions, and make our own decisions. In this, the most complex classroom setting that anyone could ever imagine or come up with, where the veil of forgetfulness has been placed over our minds, we are all taking our very own great final exam. But God has left none of us alone. Inside each of us is the most complex and sophisticated cell phone that you could ever imagine, and it has a direct line right to him. The person inside you, the one that makes your fingers work and your toes wiggle and your arms and legs and your chest pound and your heart work, that person already knows God. 
Listen to him. Don't listen to the people who tell you there is no such thing as God. Listen to the person inside you. That person already knows God and cannot be talked out of believing that there is a God because he lived with him at one time and he knows him and he remembers him. Ask him about God. And so don't be afraid to reach out to God, for, to God and ask him for help. Might as well. He's up all night anyway. According to the National Center for PTSD, working with the American Veterans Affairs, there are two evidence-based treatments for PTSD, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing theory or therapy. Prolonged exposure works kind of like this, making a, a something very simple. It's kind of like if you fell off a horse and now you're too afraid to get back on a horse, get out there and get back on that horse until that fear goes away. Or if you were driving down the road and you were in a brown pickup truck and you got in an accident and now you can't be around brown pickup trucks, go sit in brown pickup trucks until that feeling goes away. What it is, is you return to the place or activity where that memory, until that memory fades away. So I'm not going to say any more about that. The cognitive processing therapy is far more complex and requires a lot more training and skill. And the gamut of help can come from a wide variety of helpers, beginning with your trained peer support team member or your chaplain, to a trained counselor, and all the way to a licensed, skilled, and professional clinician. Here are other steps that you will follow in getting over PTSD, and the steps that they will teach you to get over PTSD. Step number one, you need to begin by purging. You need to tell your story. You need to verbally vomit. You need to get it out. What's inside has to come out. If you need to, begin by writing the experiences down. You need to purge and writing about the experience is a good first step. But your goal is to be able to talk it out. The entire event, where you were, what you saw, what you did, etc. It's more than talking, it's learning the skills needed to cope and exchange the bad thoughts and feelings for good ones. Step number two. Your next step or phase is to talk about your feelings during the event. If you have a hard time talking about your feelings, maybe you're a little bit too macho for that one, then talk about your thoughts during the event instead. What was going through your mind? Step number three. Now, Talk about what you have done since the event. How has your life gone? What have you been doing since the event and how has it been working for you? Step number four, and this is where it starts to get hard. Stop taking ownership for the things that do not belong to you. For example, let's say you were driving your car with your best friend, driving in your car with your best friend, and another driver runs a red light and runs smack into the side of you and kills your friend. You are devastated that your friend is killed and you blame yourself for his death. Well, you have to realize that it was not your actions that killed your friend. You were just driving the car. That is all you are responsible for. It is not your fault your friend is dead. Stop owning his death. In your traumatic experiences, whatever they are, Stop taking ownership for things that don't belong to you. Step number five. Now comes the really hard part. Are you ready for this? Take extreme ownership of your actions and stop blaming others or things for the way you behave. For example, you might say, my marriage is on the rocks because I have PTSD. No, your marriage is on the rocks because of your behavior because of what you've been doing. Another example, you might say, my job is in jeopardy because I have PTSD. No, your job is in jeopardy because of your behavior. Take ownership of your actions, extreme ownership. Taking extreme ownership is extremely difficult as most people want to blame something or someone else for the way things are going in their life. You blocking this path of escape for yourself is paramount to your future happiness. Because the truth is, only you can control you. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist 
A psychiatrist and a Jewish Holocaust survivor of the Nazi concentration camp, Thersenstadt. During his four years there, unspeakable dehumanizing tortures were performed on him by the German doctors. Frankel chose self-control and chose not to respond to the, hum to the inhumane things that were done to him. And he taught others to do the same. After the war, he taught the Holocaust survivors who wanted to commit suicide because of the atrocities that were done to them to choose life instead. He said, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last human freedom, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. He also said, between stimulus and response there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Step number six, repatriate yourself into your life again. Learn to change your behavior. Learn to become the kind of person you'd like to be around again. Learn to date your spouse again, to become valuable to your employer again to be loved, cherished, respected, instead of feared by your children and your peers again. In the book On Combat by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, on page 269 is this quote, you might walk into the door after a horrible day and run smack into an angry spouse. It is important, therefore, that you, right now, while you are calm and rational, you ask yourself, who are they really angry at? Are they angry at you? No. They are angry at the world, and in their confusion, they might displace their anger onto you. Do not let your loved one's confusion and misplaced anger distance you from them at a time when you need them most. Hug them, hold them, and cherish them. Wait for their emotions to pass, and know that they will still be there for you when you need them. And it goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, stop your counseling sessions with Jack Daniels and Jim Beam and any of their friends. They pretend to be your friends, but they are not your friends. And they will ruin your life and continue to make the problem worse. And also, never consider a counseling session with Smith and Wesson. They will not make the problem any better either. And they will only shove it off on someone else and they will make the problem worse for them and for you. Just because you pass on doesn't mean that your problem is gone from you. You still live. Your, your spirit is still there and it's going to know what you did. So you never take a counseling session from Smith and Wesson or any of his friends either. Think of the zebra. He roams the field eating the grass and living life large. When the lion chases him, he runs for his life. But as soon as the lion stops chasing him, he stops running and he goes right back to roaming the field, eating the tall grass, and living life large again. If you have PTSD, stop running and believe that life can be normal again. There are six follow-up steps in your recovery process that you need to know about as well, and here they are. Number one, you need to learn to throw away the rocks in your bag, literally. When you have completed the six therapy steps just mentioned, write your problems on a rock and then take them to a lake or a canyon or someplace important to you and literally throw them away. In a ceremony fashion if you like, but throw them away physically and mentally. Number two, learn the value of the buddy system. Captain Charles Plum, a retired U.S. Navy F-4 fighter pilot in Vietnam, was shot down and became a POW. In the book, Lessons Learned from the Hanoi Hilton, he points out that 30.6% of the American Vietnam soldiers acquired PTSD, but only 4% of the POWs acquired it. Why? because of the buddy system they developed to watch out for each other and encourage each other to keep going. Number three, realize that like an addiction, only you can stop this. Others can help, others can be kind and considerate and lead the way and point the way, but only you have the control to stop it and to create a new life for yourself. Number four, 
be strong. Commit. If you have to, start over every day until you no longer have to keep starting over. Number five. If you get 10 different mental health clinicians together, you'll probably find several disputed best ways to handle PTSD. The point is this, if you are working with a clinician or a professional or someone else, if you are working with someone and that is not working, even if you've gone through or you're going through your EAP program, get someone else to help you. Maybe you're just not connecting with that individual. But also know this, if you go through too many people or too many programs and still can't be helped, you might want to take a look at you because it's probably you that is the problem. And you might need to realize that you need to change you. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Viktor Frankl spent his whole post-concentration camp life trying to help other people deal with the horrific concentration camp experiences they had. He wrote his world-famous book, Saying Yes to Life in Spite of Everything, in 1946. The title later became changed to Man's Search for Meaning. In his book, he tells that he survived his concentration camp experiences by finding personal meaning in his experiences. He also learned that those who did not lose their sense of purpose were able to survive much longer in the concentration camp than those that did. Frankel received 29 honorary doctoral degrees. He wrote 39 books which were translated into as many as 40 languages. And he spent his whole life helping others with their psychological healing from their own painful experiences. He taught people to find meaning in their life and in their experiences and to use those experiences to make themselves stronger and other people better. And he taught people who wanted to commit suicide to choose life instead and to help others to do the same. He said, what man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for some goal worthy of him. And in my own life, brothers and sisters, I can testify to you that my greatest growth periods, my greatest experiences have come through adversity. The ones that I really remember, they, they came through adversity. And I can promise you that if you really want to feel the healing balm of the Lord in your life, reach out and help someone else with their problems. What is to give light must endure burning. Here at the end, I have some survivor stories that I want to leave you with. They are actually just links that you can go to and watch these stories on your own. But each video will bring you a new tool for your toolbox, if you let them. Each video will change your life for the better and lead you down the road of recovery. The last survivor story is actually from a book that was written in 1894. I'll tell you more about it later. But it's about a young Civil War soldier who gets involved in the war, believing that it's a great and glorious thing, and then becomes afraid. So let me tell you just a little bit about these stories real quick. The first story is by a soldier by the name of Hadari. He served in the U.S. Army Reserve National Guard. He says, it took me six months after I returned home to finally admit that I had PTSD and I needed help with my anger management. And now, he says, sometimes I see people who are having a bad day, and instead of me getting mad right back at them, I say, okay, something's wrong with you, and I move on. The next story is by Sergeant Dan Nevins of the U.S. Army. His 18,000-pound vehicle is hit by a rocket. He's partially ejected, and he loses both legs. He said, when I woke up in the hospital and realized what had happened, all I could think about is all the things that I could never do again. When I received that pin of the warrior carrying a wounded warrior off the battlefield, I instantly related to it because one week earlier, I was the guy being carried off the battlefield. I still wear that pin today, but I learned a great lesson in life. I learned that we all get crazy pitches thrown at us. And now, when I look at that pin, I still see one warrior carrying another warrior off the battlefield. But I relate now more to the warrior on the bottom. The next story is by Sergeant Joey Jones, U.S. Marine Corps Bomb Disposal Unit. 
One day he steps on a landmine and loses both legs. He said, initially I knew what had happened. I saw my legs were gone and I could see the blood loss. I was afraid I wouldn't make it. I asked a buddy of mine to pray with me. And then in the hospital he says, I feel so great. I didn't lose my legs. I was given a second chance at life. The next story is by U.S. Army Specialist Brandon Morocco, one of the very few soldiers to lose all four limbs in battle and survive. After I was hit, he says, and my gunner was killed and I was transported, I got 50 units of blood and later on another 10. It was coming out of me as fast as they could pour it in. They had to replace my carotid artery with a vein from my groin. I got my new legs just four months ago. I've been walking on them something I'm extremely proud of. I was an athlete. It's what I used to do, and it's what I will continue to do. Whenever someone tells me that I can't do something, I always shut them down and I go ahead and do it. All things, he said, I will accomplish. The next story is by Tim Gutizus, Alsace, Illinois Fire Department. He tells his story and then he says, I'm now living a more balanced life. It's still going to be there, but not the same way. My wife is the focal point of my healing experience. She is, without a doubt, my best friend in the whole world. This experience gave me the freedom to love my wife in a more spiritual level than ever before. Now the most gratifying part of my recovery is that I can help others do the same. In the face of adversity, he said, you always have to have the courage to take the high road. The next video is a news story by Al Jazari American News, as seen on America Tonight. It's titled, The Leading Cause of Police Death, PTSD. What is the number one cause of police death, the interviewer asks. Suicide, said Ron Clark, badge of life. We know what doesn't work. Alcohol doesn't work. Drugs don't work. Sex doesn't work. You have to be able to talk to somebody confidentially. The movie that I want to talk to you about is called The Red Badge of Courage. I saw it as a kid and I never forgot it because of the way that it made me feel and the things that I learned when I watched it. It's about a young Union soldier in the Civil War by the name of Henry. Like many young men, Henry went to war thinking it was glorious, a great place for heroes. But in his first battle, he became so afraid he threw down his musket and he ran, deserting the battlefield. While struggling with his emotions about running away, he is struck in the head by another Union soldier who is running away as well. When Henry comes to, he is sickened, even mortified, at what he had done. He later relocated his company and made up a story that during the fighting he became separated from the company and was shot in the head. His friend dresses the wound and then says, it looks like just a bump on the head. But Henry sticks to his story that he was shot in the head during the battle. The bandage around his head becomes Henry's red badge of courage. He proudly wears it for his whole company to see. As you struggle with your recovery from PTSD, you will find many that have PTSD wearing their PTSD like it is their red badge of courage. Don't you be one. Don't you wallow in it. And don't you glory in it. Get away from it and leave it alone and teach others to do the same. As the story continues, Henry decides he's not ever going to run from the battlefield again. In his next charge, he forces himself to lead the charge. As the Union flag bearer is killed, Henry picks up the American flag and continues running toward the Southern soldiers. He then comes to the stumbling and badly wounded flag bearer of the South. The movie ends with Henry and his best friend walking off the battlefield together. As they do, they hear the sounds of the birds chirping in the trees above. Henry says, listen to the birds. As soon as the shooting stops and the smoke clears, they go right back to singing. And that, my friend, is the goal and the cure for PTSD. Now I'm going to give you a couple of bonus videos as well. In June of 2005, Marcus Luttrell, U.S. Navy SEAL, who was fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, became known as the lone survivor. The predominant thing, he said, the predominant thing about a Navy SEAL is our never-quit attitude. 
It's not that we're better than everyone else. It's that basically you have to kill us before we stop getting up. Everyone can cop out and say, well, I was dealt a bad hand. So what? Get up and keep moving. Interviewer. How did you make it out when your team was dead? Marcus. I wasn't dead. So I just kept crawling. I was shot twice in the back and pretty much everything from my chest down was numb. But my arm still worked. So I took a rock and I drew a line in the sand in front of me and I crawled until my feet were past the rock or past the line. Then I did it again and again. Interviewer, how far did you crawl like that? Marcus, for seven miles. The second bonus video is a guy by the name of Ian Humphrey, who is neither a soldier, neither a police officer, or a fireman, or a first responder of any kind, but is just a man with an incredible survivor story. When I was four, he said, I was placed into a foster home. Mrs. Alexander would lock me in a closet and turn off the lights. She beat me, kicked me, and it was the very first time I was sexually assaulted. I have scars you can't see, but on my hand I have one where she burned me with an iron. But the most she ever did to hurt me was to open the door of the closet and look down at me and say, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. When my mother died at age 12, I didn't understand. I started acting out, hanging out with the wrong crowd, breaking into homes, stealing cars. I got sent to prison for 15 years. In there, I met a guard who called me Mr. Humphrey. He came into my cell one day and said, Mr. Humphrey, prison doesn't have to be your life. He said, you can get out of here and do great things. Then he turned and walked away and stopped and turned back and said, I believe in you. If he had turned back around one more time, he would have seen tears coming down my face because nobody has ever said that to me. Brothers and sisters, PTSD is real and it's okay to admit that you have it and it's okay to admit to your friends that you have it. But if you have it, get rid of it. Don't waller in it, don't glory in it, don't walk it, don't wear it like a red badge of courage. Get rid of it. And be the person that you always wanted to be and be the person that others want you to be and most importantly, be the person God wants you to be. God bless and thank you for making a difference in the lives of other people out there. Red roses too I'll watch 